In this video, Bill Riles, my good friend, joins me to play Backgammon versus the Bot. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe. You'll be notified every time I upload a new video. Let me know what you think in the comments below and what you'd like to see in future videos so I can work on that. I appreciate your super thanks. These small donations help me continue to create the high quality content that you enjoy. Now with the membership feature, you can get exclusive access to the most popular videos. My book, Backgammon, Backgame Strategies, is available. There's a link in the description to where you can get it. And if you're interested in lessons, please contact me via email. My email address is in the description. Again, in this video, it's my great pleasure to have my good friend, Bill Riles, by way of introduction. He really needs no introduction. He's done so much for Backgammon. He is probably most famous for, for all the things he does uh, with Ace Point Backgammon and the streaming, but he's done so many other things, including his involvement with the U.S. Backgammon Federation and many other things. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have you and welcome, Bill. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to, to join you today. It's, it's always a pleasure to see you. And I always look forward to your streams. Usually they're in exotic lo locations, many hours ahead of where I live. So I wake up early in the morning to hear your voice. <laughs> Well, we uh, we hope you enjoy them. I mean, that's uh, you know the impetus. We we love doing what we do in that regard, and um, you know we just want to bring these great tournaments and great players uh, to the masses, if you will. And, yes, yes. Uh, you know, it, it's a lot of fun, and we try to uh, you know balance the the stream from a sense that, you know, I'll, I'm the commentator. Usually I'll get an expert co-host if, uh, if available and, and typically they are, but, you know, I try to make it a, a very watchable uh, commentary and stream such that, you know, we get the technical stuff across, but we keep it a little lighter too. So that it's more watchable. There's some, you know, some human interest stories, there's anecdotes, there's, uh, you know, and keep people apprised of what's going on, you know, within the tournament as a whole. So it's it's just a lot of fun and people enjoy it. And uh, and that's what it's all about. And of course, I have the benefit of uh, Tara's uh, audio and video yeah. production skills. And uh, it's just, it's a neat thing. Absolutely. I, I tell people you are the king and queen of backgammon and streaming i uh, wanted to talk about a few things you uh you've been together with tara for some time but you recently got married so congratulations well thank you very much <clears throat> i was okay. teasing uh, someone commented on that the other day and i said well yeah you know i finally uh satisfied the eight and a half year probationary and trial run period so we went ahead and got married <laughs> <laughs> I I saw this uh this uh post on Facebook. <laughs> you, you're not quite there yet, but I saw this post on Facebook by um Bill Simborg, and he's like, "Oh, when you're really old like I am, how is it to you know date people?" It's like it's good. I don't have to worry about meeting their parents. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you're not there yet. <laughs> but yeah, um, it's kind of interesting. Tards from a a very small family in a sense. She has very few relatives and, and the essentially the only one is an uncle who uh, lives in New Jersey, but he travels quite a bit and him and his wife are going to be in town tomorrow and have invited us to dinner and we've not told them. So we'll, <laughs> I haven't told them yet. Okay. We'll, we'll surprise them over dinner. I mean, we, you know, I've, I've known them and, We've been out with him any number of times, just but uh, so that'll be a surprise for tomorrow night. Very good, very good. Congratulations, of course, on that. And another big congratulations. Uh, recently, it was announced that you and Tara will be receiving the US BGF Lifetime Achievement Award. And I have pulled this up on the screen. Are you able to see that now, Bill? Yes, I am. Okay, so a lot of people are not familiar with all the things you have done. Uh, but I'll put a link in the description to where people can go to this um, 
people don't know, you were uh, formerly the president of the USBGF. Para has done a lot of marketing. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff. People can read this. You've done the Texas Backgammon Championships for over a decade, uh, video streaming locally, nationally, internationally in some of the best venues. Uh, so really want to give you a big congratulations. It's definitely well-deserved and long overdue, in my opinion. So thank you for everything you've done. Well, thank you very much. I saw your new little uh, interview with Patrick Jabaley uh, a couple of days ago. And, uh, you know, it was kind of interesting when it, talking about uh, streaming from the top of the Burj Khalifa. And yes, yes. Notebook. And that was uh, – that was a lot of fun. It, it was challenging to to get yeah, I everything remember. moved to the other venue and, and back in a short period of time. But it was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, as you can imagine, the, the views were just astonishing. Right. And, uh, so I think he got a lot of mileage uh, in promotion with that. You know, it was funny. Uh, Victor Askenazi and I are great friends. And, and he had planned to go, but then he – he, at the end, he decided not to go. He said it's too hot that time of the year in in Dubai. Yeah. Although this year it's going to be a few weeks later. But right. you know, afterwards, when they had the final of the Burj Khalifa, and there was that picture shot from the bottom with the guy holding the board, and you could see the entire building behind him. Victor says, uh, "That should have been me," you know. And I said, well, "Victor, <laughs> you know." You, you can't win if you don't show. Right? So, That's true. So, That's true. Uh, it, um, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, he, he runs a great tournament there. Really, it's, you know, I've been doing this for almost a year now with this YouTube channel, and I've had the privilege of meeting uh, so many wonderful people like you, Patrick Jabaley, and, and so many others. Um, it, it's just, you know, you really can't put into words like the friendships that you make. It's, it's really invaluable. Well, it's a, you know, it's a small close knit community, the global backgammon community. And, uh, you know, the, we just love to be part of that. And, uh, you know, by virtue of our travels and streaming and what have you, we probably know the vast majority of the top yeah. players around the world. And uh, and that's a blast. It's it's really a blast. Yeah, yeah, uh, wonderful. So before we start, maybe you can tell us about um, your upcoming schedule for the rest of the year. Where else are you going to be going to and streaming? Well, here in about a month, we're going to the Chicago Open Rory's tournament, and we'll yeah. be doing the streaming and uh, commentary there as we've done for years with Rory's tournaments. And then we go international <laughs> and. Uh, we're going, uh, and each of these are about 15 or 16 day trips in total oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. we have to get there a little early to, to do the setup. And then it takes us a day or two to break everything down and repack it at the conclusion. But we're going to the, uh, first part of July's Swedish open right. in Stockholm, which is this year in conjunction with the uh, WBGF World Team Championship and World Individual Championship. The WBGF events will take place first at, early in the week and then the Swedish Open late in the week. And uh, Jorgen Grandstad is uh, organizing that. Uh, Arta Fendikaglu is the uh, director. And of course, we've worked with Arta any number of times in big tournaments. Right. So, um, so then we come home from Stockholm and we're home six days, I think, <laughs> and turn around and go to Monte Carlo. And yeah, that, that should be great. Once again, we're streaming and providing commentary services with uh, the Bagham and World Championships. And this year, the UBC Contender Tournament yeah. precedes that. So between the UBC Contender Tournament and then their warm up tournaments on the first weekend and then the main event starts on Tuesday. Uh, it's like, oh, I forget, 11 or 12 days straight of streaming and backgammon. And, of course, Arta, again, is uh, the director of that. Mark Olson is the uh, organizer and director right. or mm -hmm. executive director, I guess you would say, or whatever. So that's uh, 
that's always a blast. A lot of work. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're always the first, the first there every morning and the last ones to leave every night, pretty much. Right, right. And then, uh, so then we're back around August 4th, I think. And then in mid-September, we are, we're off to Dubai for yeah. 10 or 16 days. And uh, and that was just such a, a thrill last year. We'd never been there. The tournament was superb. Uh, the facilities were superb. And then, you know, going to the Burj Khalifa uh, was amazing. And then, you know, and he explained the other day, they have this uh, – a desert experience thing on. Oh on, yeah, yeah. After yeah. the tournament, and that was just amazing. So uh, it was it was a lot of fun. You yeah, know, yeah. I was, want your job, Bill. It was hilarious. <laughs> in the One very briefly, I'll tell you that. Uh, you know, we went over there a few days early for some personal time and to scope everything out. And, this, and Patrick took us to. Uh, the Burj Khalifa one day and we had to, among other things, and, you know, show passports and fill out forms and all this. I mean, it's a very, very secure uh, structure because, you know, it's such a high profile structure and it's in right. that part of the world. So we got all that worked out. And then it was funny because uh, Phil Simbler was over there and he was doing a bit of commentary and so forth. Yeah. And like on Friday before the finals on Sunday, he comes up to me and he said, Bill, Patrick says that, you know, I can do some string. I can help you if you if you can use me on the team, you know. And I said, well, Phil, I said, I don't have a problem in using you on the team, but you've got a problem in getting into the building. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's Friday <laughs> afternoon, which is Friday is the Sabbath, I think, in the Muslim world. So, um, you know, there was just no way he was going to clear all the hurdles to get into there. <laughs> but that's what I, I laughed. I said, I, you know, I can get you in the team, but I can't get you in the building. You can go back and talk to Patrick about that. But... <laughs> so, well, that's great. That's great. You have a lot of great experiences with commentary. And, and today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to actually play. So that's, that's, that's going to be fun. It'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it. You know, I, as most people in the backgammon world, I use XG a lot to analyze matches and to, uh, you know, input specific positions that I might see in a match that I'm watching or whatever. I rarely play XG because, you know, I use it as an analysis tool and, um, and so forth, but I, I don't play it that much. And, it, and it's kind of interesting because, you know, I've given some lessons in the past and talked to people, primarily less experienced people. And I'll tell them it's great to play XG, but you got to know what you're doing. You know, if you, most right. people will play XG and they'll crank it up all the way. And, uh, you know, that's fine to learn like that if it's, you know, Victor's playing mochi or something, you know, but you're not going to be playing humans that play like that, you know, so you got to be careful. You know, some people, I've run into it a couple of times, people just develop these almost bad habits from that. They they learn that everything's a take. Right. And I'm like, well, everything's a take because XG is giving you perfectly efficient cubes. Right but you're not going to see perfectly efficient cubes in real life. you know. <laughs> right, right. As a matter of fact, XT gives a lot of actually inefficient cubes, meaning it's barely a double. Um, right. So just well, because- I regard that in my vernacular, that's a, an efficient cube, right? It's <laughs> absolutely the instant that it's uh, right. mathematically a, a cube, you know? Correct, correct. And it's almost... By virtue of that, it's almost always a take. Right. You're right. And I was referring to Dirk Scheman's book where he defines it and like Kit Woolsey's law is uh, the, the most efficient double is when it's on the take pass borderline because that's when you gain the most equity. Anyway, exactly. that's that's very technical, but that's true. That's 
very important for people to understand. I think you can change the settings for XG you so it does can. not play strong. The number one reason why I play XG um, so much is because it's quick and I can pause the game and go go see go to an appointment and then come back. Um, whereas you can't do that when you're playing in person or online and things like that. Exactly. Um, it's a tool for learning for me. Uh, but it's it's important, you know, however people like it. The most important thing is to have fun. I tell people backgammon is a game. If you're not having fun, you shouldn't be playing. Absolutely. It's such a it's a great social game. I mean, it's always Absolutely. been a social game. And uh, so, yeah, enjoy it. Have fun with it. You know, recognize. I don't care who you are. You're going to lose a lot, right? Oh, yeah, yeah <laughs> and yeah. Uh, you just get used to it. It's a uh, a myriad of ups and downs, even within a given match. And uh, don't let the you know the bad rolls get to you too much, and don't get too excited with the good rolls. And uh, yeah. just play every every roll to the best of your ability, and live with the outcome. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. So we can get started. We're playing on a beautiful Jeffrey Parker board. The XG board is made by Rain. He makes beautiful XG boards. There's a link in the description to where you can get them. We're playing on the special Texas Backgammon Championships one I've used exclusively for you. Um, you have the special one. Uh, let me go ahead and start it. It'll be a three-point match. Um, You'll play the snake brown checkers at the bottom, XG the white checkers at the top. Uh, go ahead and let me know if you want to roll uh, and how you'd like to play. Um, and I'll just move everything. And uh, certainly you're welcome to consult with me. Ultimately, as the guest, you have the final decision. So XG started with an opening 6-1, making the bar point. So now, now it's a 4-1. Okay, so I'm going to... Uh... Play 13, 9, and 24, 23. Split the, yep. split the backs to, you know, try to perhaps escape and or increase the probability of making a uh, advanced anchor against uh, his developing crime. That's great. And I, I really like the way you do your commentary. We're going to have viewers of different levels, so it's, it's good to be talking about um, all the different things for uh, novice players as well as advanced ones. Um, okay, 6-4 makes the point on head. Six five, so the five is four. Okay, the five, and um, I think I'll just I'll just run on with that one. Right. So you don't want to be on the point that the opponent next wants to make. Exactly. You know. And and I don't want to throw another blot out and play in the into my right. outfield either. So four three left a direct shot making the four point. Now we still got to roll six three. Okay. Okay, so. I'm going to hit on the 18 yep. and then come across to the 11. Just safety that one. Okay. Double one. All right. Makes the five point. Now you're up in the race, but not, not, not a double yet. Right, Bill? No, I'm, I'm not going to double here. I, I like the, the structure. Uh, oftentimes, you know, and again, it's interesting because playing XG is different than playing people. Um, you know, you can you can bully some people, <laughs> or you maybe take advantage right, of right, somebody right. that is uh, less experienced and all. I'm not quite there with this structure, but I, I do like to be aggressive with uh, when I have a lot of potential. But uh, yeah, we'll roll on. If this checker on the 18 point, maybe we're on the nine point. Absolutely. Then, yes. then you would consider. So afterwards, we'll take a look and we'll be able to modify these things and see. Okay. Um, okay. Double one. Okay. I'm going to unstack the six, make the five. Yes. And make the, make the nine. Yeah. I think that's, that's great. It consolidates your position. It does leave a shot, but there was nothing you can do about it. Um, and you're creating a little bit of a climbing structure. Correct. It's, uh, you know, and thing. actually it, it you can't do anything about safety in that checker in any event. Plus, right. you've done two very constructive things. Plus, it's back on the 18. It dupes his six. So uh, one of the numbers that could allow him to try to start moving his back checkers is also the number that he needs to to hit me on the 18. Yeah, the big one would be, I think, 6-5. Because it's like, 
that would be a difficult play to make if you're white having a six five here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. There. <laughs> it came out like that. Look at that. Just, just like answer. that, huh? I was gonna ask you how you how would you play six five if you were white, but we have the answer already. Okay. So uh <laughs> all right, five three. So the three is forced and a five. Whew. I'm gonna play 13 8. Yeah. I I don't want if I'm gonna get hit, I want to get hit loose in the infield or in the home board rather than getting hit in the outfield. And um, you know, and this also were things to go south and and uh you know, I end up having to try to save a G or something. I've gained five pips by playing uh, 13 8 as well. Right, and a crossover. Okay. Five four. Okay. And there's what we talk about. He 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 hits me, but he has to leave the block to the do block. so. So you can hit with any three, two one, as well as things like double one, double four. No. Okay. So now it's a double. Yeah, and with him, uh, several fold here. One, and I'm obviously going to pass. Um, you know, another thing that comes into play here a little bit. I, I use the phrase at times, um, short match theory <laughs> in a three point match. If you, uh, you know, take a cube and get G matches over, uh, where if it's, and not that I would take this in a long match necessarily, but I, I like the idea of, uh, you know, musing about short game theory. So sometimes, uh, you're perhaps more aggressive or, or less aggressive in taking, uh, because of that. So I, I'm going to pass on this. Yeah. W what would need to be different in order to, to have a take? Like, let's say this checker on the eight point where it's still on the midpoint. Would you take it there? Yeah, then I, I would very likely take it then. Um, you know, he's he's got some, uh, some good things going for him, but he's got some, uh, you know, some – some downside too, or, or some uh, liability, shall we say, he's still got two checkers to, yeah. to escape. I have a lot of potential to, you know, maybe fill in that, uh, that bar point of mine, at least to, if not in whole, at least in part initially. So, um, yeah, word on the word on the bar or on the mid, um, I might well take it. Yeah. That's, that's the nice thing about this. Like, Obviously, it's it's fun, uh, but this is how I learned. Like, so after the match, we'll go through and modify things and see what would make it a take. And that's a very valuable learning lesson. Like, for example, even if you keep this here, if this checker on the 18 point were on the 24 point, that would be another different story, too. Yeah, he still, I mean, that just uh, increases his liability side of the ledger. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. He, yeah. Uh, you know, rather than have uh, two to get out, he's got three to get out. And of course, right. you know, you're always in those sorts of situations. You're always uh, vulnerable to certain big doubles and so forth. And, uh, you know, and that's why we're always looking uh, to have some diversification of some part of, of some uh, fashion in these sort of cases. So, you know, were he to have a third checker back on the 24, then, you know, he's got uh, fours and fives, which don't play well for him and move a lot of freight. If he yeah. were to, you know, be back on the 24 and roll a set of fives or a set of fours, uh, he doesn't have any timing left after that at right. all. Right, right. Okay, very good. So we'll pass, continue. Uh, now four, three, down zero to one, three away. Two. Yeah, so I'm uh, zero to one. Sure. I'm going to play to the nine and 24, 21. Okay. Double six. All right. Now double three. Okay, three. So I'm, I've got to step up and, and, and make that point. I think I'm going to make the three and slot the five. Yeah, I, mean, I want to try to build a board as quickly as I can. If I get hit and have to recirculate that checker, it, it doesn't bother me particularly. Okay. Six five. Okay. 
Now, okay. you want to double aggressively at this score, but not quite yet, right? Not quite yet. <laughs> no, obviously. 2-1. Two, 2-1. One. Two, one. Here, I think I am going to play somewhat aggressively and go 13-11, uh, 6-5. If he wants to hit me, or one, he's got to be able to hit me. But if he is able to hit me, you know, he's got a blot in his, in his home board back there. He has to give up that uh, my bar point to, to do it. And he ends up maybe, you know, he's got two or three blots exposed uh, after he hits me. Yeah, that's that's one thing for some of the viewers is you don't want to get into a hitting exchange when you have the weaker board. When you have the stronger board, you're a favorite in a potential hitting exchange. So you don't want to leave a lot of blood. So good lesson. All right, five three. Yeah, so as as you can see, or anyone can see, I mean, I you know, I got lucky in a sense that he didn't hit me, and I'm in a much better position to to uh, continue to try to construct a board. Okay, so let's roll. Let's roll, okay, five, four. Uh, so again, not the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm gonna play 11, 6, 13, 9. Yeah, that's good. It consolidates everything. The other thing I yeah, was I'd, you know, I, I would have liked to have uh, flat. started or made the four, but uh, I don't. I, I think I'm I'm satisfied with my structure. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Four one plays behind. Okay. Now six three. Okay. I think I'm gonna play eight five eight two. Yeah, yeah I, I could I could break the nine, but then that uh, doesn't give me as much diversification as uh, playing as breaking the eight does. Right. So, uh, let's go. Yeah, they say you have you would have this dilly builder, and you know. You, you exactly probably, and yeah. and then i'm you know i'm going to be stripped everywhere as it is yeah. anyway yeah um, yeah remember paul mcgreal used to say put your checkers where they belong and by that he was usually referring to the dilly builder here this one doesn't belong here it belongs here right so there you put it exactly where it belongs and now you have builders on two points then only on one you know and and i've got now uh, an equal board to his maybe even a you know, an advantageous board in comparison to his because I have a stronger points and so forth. And right, he, right. And he's got to play, right? He's he's stripped on the mid, he's stripped on right. my bar, he's stripped on the eight. So uh, let's see what happens. Yeah. All right, four, one. Okay, play safe. So now you can hit with ones and nines. So six, three, and five, four. Yeah, I'm still, uh, I'm down what 13. I'm not quite ready. I, I like where I'm at because he's uh, you know, if I can maintain the the uh, the midpoint there, then he's got a little trouble uh clearing, you know, from the from the 18. So let's just let's roll. Let's roll. The the other thing I tell people is this is kind of diversification and three ply, looking three three plays in advance. So what I mean is let's say um you hit loose here and you cover okay you're going to have blots on the 13 and on the 12 that can be hit back with return fives and six and if white were on the bar fives and six are not good to come in but then they become diversified to be hit so six four five four six one and five one all hit so that's like something to think about like in advance and that's part of the reason why he stripped, he broke the midpoint. Um, okay, double four. Okay. Well, this is tempting in certain regards. Uh,
I think I'm going to make the two and make the ace. Like that. Like that. Yeah. Uh, Looks good. It's, you know, it's almost an even race. Uh, he's got, you know, if he were to hit me again, he's only got a three point board. If I have to recirculate a checker, um, it buys me some time. And he's very likely, if he does hit me, he's going to have some exposure uh, on my returns. And I have a five point board. That's right. And some of the twos are also duplicated here. Like you know, that's one thing, and, and you and I know this, but in, in teaching people at times, uh, you know, too many people try to play too safe at times, particularly inexperienced players. And I know I've talked to uh, various great players, you know, for 20 years and so forth. And I always remember you can ask almost anyone, what's the most difficult thing for some for novice players or beginning players to learn? And it's to play with blocks, right? Because they more often than not, you know, they want to play station to station, station to station and not leave uh, not leave anything exposed. And and I could have done that here. Um, you know, instead of playing to the to the deuce, I guess, whatever it was, I could have played nine five. And uh, and not left any out there, but I, you know, I wouldn't have had a five point board. I wouldn't have right. uh, any more. I wouldn't have as much pressure on his next play as I do in playing in this fashion. So let's go for it and see what happens. I think in that sense, backgammon is a good analogy to life. You always have to determine the risk and the reward and weigh them accordingly. Here, are the other things I, I see is like, let's say. He rolls a three, two. If he's going to hit, he can't make the five point. Exactly. And if he rolls like a, a four, two or a two, one, there's going to be blots everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Six, four. Safe. Okay. So he's pretty much forced there. Now, where are we? I'm plus seven, so I'm behind. But, uh, I'm tempted, but I'm just going to roll. Yeah. So we talk about like market losing sequences. So that's a sequence of two rolls, one by you and that one by the opponent, which would make it a pass. And I don't really see many of them. Do you? No. I mean, even, even, uh, you know, we're out to get fortunate with double fives, double sixes, whatever. I'm still going to have a blot somewhere that he's shooting at yeah. and I'm not going to have a, you know, with him on the roll, I'm, I'm going to have, you know, even if it were sixes, I've got a 17 pip lead, but, um, you know, I, I, I can't clean it up so that there's no, uh, rewarding safety. Yeah. You're going to need at least double sixes or something like that. Yeah. Okay. And, and by at two away, um, uh, three way as it is, you know, not only do you have to be careful of, you know, I want to be aggressive to try to capture here, but I don't want to give him a too easy free play for the match either. Right, right, right. Okay. So three, two. So there's that three, two you'd mentioned earlier. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was for white, but yeah, I, I remember that. Okay, so me, oh boy, yeah, you were talking white, but I'm just going to slot the four, and right. he, he's got to play. Yeah, there's no other productive option, really. Okay, double I mean, three. In certain regards, that was probably one of my best rolls at the, yeah. that point in time. Safety, I got safety. to slot the four, and I didn't burn a lot of pips in doing right. so. Right. And now you're still behind 14, so not, not a double yet, right? Yeah, I'm just uh, rolling. Rolling? All right. Now we're talking. That's uh, all but forced, is it not? Like I mean, that. I could play all the way to the ace, but um, this I'm minus 10, so this is it. Yeah, it moves a lot of freight, as you say. That's one of my favorite phrases that you say. <laughs> all right. Double three. 
Now, okay. and that's kind of interesting. Now it's it's all but a dead even race. He's up two pips. Ah, uh, too close. I'm just going to roll. Uh, hopefully, I'll maintain the the mid, and he perhaps has to uh, has to give me something. Yeah. So sometimes the way I look at it is from the opponent's point of view. Say you were white here, and you would you were doubled. Would you hesitate to take? Not at all. Yeah. So that kind of tells me that's like what uh, Phil Simborg says, the reverse Woolsey's law. If you're not sure, if you're sure it's a take, um, then you have to be more cautious about doubling. Right. And I, I mean, and were I to double at this point, not only the, you know, the great point that you just made, but like I, to use the phrase I used a few minutes ago, I mean, it gives him an easy free play for the match too. He's only right. two away. Right. At two away, you take a lot easier, especially at, at two away, five away. The dead cube take point is the lowest in a five point match, about 17 percent. And the other thing is it will be a dead cube because you will kill the cube um, if you turn it, um, whereas it's not the case the other way around. Um, OK, so roll five, two. So I'm just playing off the nine, both of them. OK. Four, one. All right, now it's an even race. Got to roll, an, right? Now it's an, I'm rolling. Okay, what are the market losers here now? Oh, what do we got? Fours, fives, and sixes. There's also like six, five, six, four, six, five, five, four. Exactly. Double twos, probably. Now are they uh, the six, four, six, five? Those those probably aren't market losers, though. Depending on what white rolls. Depending on what roll, but right. I would be with a six four. I'd be up eleven. If he rolls an average roll of somewhat, then I'm going to be up three or four, and it's still right. a big position for him. But you know, right. the big doubles, I would have enough lead that I yeah you know, yeah yeah okay or two. So I'm just going to the going to the ace. Now he's either going to have to if he rolls a six, certain sixes six one six two six three. I got a shot. If, uh, you know, if he can't clear them both in that fashion, then he's got to break his board. Um, so let's see. Okay. Three, two. Okay. Yeah, that's the board breaker. So now what are we? Up by one. Plus one. So I, I, I mm, man, plus one. I think I'm going to send it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And do you think white will take? I think white will take. Yeah. Okay. You were right. Okay. Now three, one. Okay. So I'm going to. Let's just play six, two. Okay. Would you consider like this? Just in case you I would, but then you know, I, I I don't have a five. If you know, if he rolled two small numbers next time, right? I don't have a five, and and by leaving it on the six, I've also got the potential in a, kind of an odd situation. But you know, were he to have to leave one in the outfield, and I hit him, I have the potential of remaking the six as well. Yeah, here if um, white rolls. Six three six two six one five three five two five one. That's twelve numbers that leave a shot, uh, and then. Yeah, I mean, there's the potential I make it. There's also the potential yeah. I give him a return too. But right, uh, right, right. So, you like this? I want that. Okay, very good. Four two. All right, three two again. Okay, now what's the count? It's still very close. I'm just going to play to the ace. Yeah. Okay. Four, two. Okay. Here's your shot. You already doubled. So looking for the three. 
There's, There's the three. three. The hard way. The hard way. All right. Double one. Okay. I'm going to make the 10 and play two one. To the five. All right. Now, probably in good shape. So there's the six. I'm taking one off. Take one off? Okay. Yeah. All right. So two off. do the rest on autopilot. <laughs> you'll, you'll assume I can bear off efficiently. <laughs> All right, so that's gin. And now we're at gammon save. So one away, two away, Crawford, five, three. Now with the two, one. Okay, I'm gonna play uh, 13, 11, 24, 23. Yep, standard, okay. Three, one makes the point. Double one. Okay, we're making the five point. Making the 23. Mm -hmm. And that's if we move it up. Okay, let's play 11 10. Yeah, this creates a builder for the four points. So now creates six the builder, points. it dupes the 6 3, so he doesn't have but only two shots, I guess. Yeah. He's yeah. got double three and six three. Yeah. Double three and six three. Um, so one extra roll uh, rather than leaving here at six four. You also have six two and six four make this point and six three and three one also make this point. So that's good. Well, and double deuces by staying on six point, you get double deuces. Right, right. Point. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So now not afraid at this score to do that. Okay. Right. Five two. Five two. Let's just put them on the eight, both of them. Both of them on the eight. What about something like this? Well, you could do that, but it, again, in that case, in either case, you're only gonna have, uh, you know, two builders, two extra builders to work with. Yeah. And I don't wanna give up the, you know, I wouldn't wanna break the eight. You don't wanna strip the eight, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Six five okay, three one. Three one. So slot the four. Yep. All right. Now here's a shot. The three two can hit, but I don't know if you want to. <laughs> well, that's that's asking to get gammoned almost. Um, <laughs> how would you like to gammon me? Um, I'm going to play to the five and make the four. Like that. Okay. Six one. Okay. Six four to the three, yeah, double three. Okay, we'll go to the make the three and go eight four. Yeah, duplicated the twos. Okay, okay, so, so there's so uh, we're hitting that now. The five. Let's go to the six point. Gives me three builders working on the deuce. Yeah, the, the other option would be like two down here. And right. the way I look at it is like, if we can make the bar point, that's really good. That so is. Like fours and ones, whereas here, I guess there's fewer builders now. Okay, six two, six four, four two make it six one's okay. Little two makes it uh, twos, yeah. Okay. So we'll try this. Yeah. Okay. Double five. All right. Two one. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna step up. Okay. And let's play uh 13, 12. 13, 12. So here, if you're gonna want to make the bar point, that would require a five one. And five is good over here. That's that's this true. Yeah, if you want to make this point, 
four two and six two are good here and you need the two there. The alternative would be to do this like this. So now ones and fours are good here, whereas here twos and fives are good and yeah. sixes are good. So that's Probably an option. An oversight on my part, but uh, I'll stay with my plate. The 1312? Yeah. Okay. All right. Two one again. Two one again. So let's uh, come up to the 21. Doesn't do me any good to have him on a 23. Uh, and then I'm going to play to the uh, play at the 11. Yep. My friend Patrick Gibson says, if you roll the same number twice in a row, he says, you must not have played it the, the right. Uh, you must not have played it right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Ash God's given you another opportunity. Yeah. All right. Six one comes out. Five, four, okay. Okay, so I'm coming out with a five and hitting with a four. All right, that's a great roll. All right, here's a chance, okay. Okay, I'm coming out. Eight, seven. Eight, seven, okay. So you're gonna leave the two, six, two. I'll give him, I'll give him the Fogerlin. Give him the Ray Fogerlin, okay. <laughs> All right. Five two. I'm gonna make the deuce. Yeah. Same number of shots. Okay. Five two. Okay. Five one. Okay. So sixteen eleven and eight seven. Yeah. In some cases, I don't think in this case, but some people would play like this to try to fish for another checker. But you don't need to win a game. I don't need to fish to in. Yeah, and that potential of getting one stuck back, he's got a yeah you know, broken six prime up there. Uh, you could get stuck. I heard there's a lot of good fishing in Texas, <laughs> <laughs> but not not here. All right, six two. Okay, so I'm gonna go. Uh, let's make sure here. Okay, I'm gonna go to the five and the fourteen. This produces more builders to try to make that last right. point. Yeah. Okay, good. Double six. So that's forced. That's forced. Three, three, four. All right. The six, six is forced. Three, three like yes. this. Yep. Double one. Okay. All right, one off. I'm going to put two on the five and take a checker off. Yeah, good. Yeah, this is, this is a, like a lot of the beginners would just, play like this what is the advantage of bringing two here it opens it up you know it, it one in. he can tell me and i'm i'm way up so i put him up 70 pips up so i don't mind if he comes in i'm going to win the race yeah uh if i were to take two off and leave you know the two on the six then uh, you know i could roll six one on the next roll and uh right six and five, then leave huh? a blot after that so yeah. i'm just I'm all but home free, so yep. I'm not going to take any chances. All right. Now. Okay, two to the five, two to the four, and take the other one off. Uh, one, two, three, four. There's the, there's also the option of doing just stack one, them all up. Yeah. Four. That makes it easier to come in, and then you're kind of home free. But here, I'm free for a couple of rolls anyway. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, five, four, five, four, four, two. Okay. Okay. So that looks like it's it. We'll take we'll take a break for a moment to let it analyze. All right, now we'll analyze it. Well played. Congratulations, Bill expert level will go through the plays and the viewers like it when they see the arrows so i'm going to put up the arrows and we'll go through all of your plays the four one after the six one was the standard split and then um after you were hit the six five was clear to just come out and then the six three that was right to hit and then just safety this coming around nothing special and then the double one was great. You consolidated this checker and made two additional points. So that was good. Uh, and then what else? The five, three, you were hit and you just had to safety it for the reasons that you mentioned. 
coming out here would just be an invitation to be hit loose and you know you'd rather be hit loose in here right, right? Um, and then the double four and here this look at this look how interesting this is this was a very comfortable take look at that yeah it's very scary these kinds of things so what i like to do is look at it on this other board are you able to see the other board now with the opening position yeah this okay yeah so i'll paste it onto this and partially you want to be careful at this score so what about like for money for money it's a borderline no double and i think the other things i like to do is like remember how we said if this checker were here right now it's probably a no double yeah it's almost a beaver for money yeah I, well I that's it's like uh, you know i think i commented on at the time that you know were it a a longer match than three points i'd have been tempted to take it because then you're you know zero zero in a longer right. match you're you're more of a money almost a right equivalent so like, money type situation anyway well let's say a five point match it's an easier take seven point match just an easier take now let's go back to the original position and see if we can modify it let's say one more checker is down here now now he has sixes and fives now it's a pass yeah um, I think that that makes a big difference, the number of checkers in the zone. If we put one more checker here, but not within six, it's a stronger double, but still a take. Yeah. I think the issue was like all these checkers, there's still a lot of work to be done. Even if you like, say, if you move one of these to here. Yeah, then it's it's probably a pass. Yeah, big yeah. pass because there's a lot less work. But well, like we say, you know, with those checkers back there, he's vulnerable to double fours, double fives. Right. Which can really, uh, really burn. Now, him. what about moving this checker from the 18 point to the midpoint? Now there's a little bit more time. It becomes stronger. There's a little bit more time to use this checker before escaping this. Right. That's, that's good. This is what I find is a very valuable learning tool when you do this kind of thing. Uh, when you, when you don't understand the position, that's, that's how I really use XG. Um, do you have any other comments about this position? No, that's uh, it's not surprising to me. But again, uh, you know, just I guess I was scared of the three point match. And uh, I agree. How many gamins does he have there? Let's see, twenty nine, thirty percent gamins. About yeah. half the wins are gamins. Yeah, but still, you're winning forty percent of the time because of all this. Um, you know, it reminds me of what you were saying earlier in the introduction that. Almost all the XG's doubles are takes. Right. <laughs> and I didn't uh, I didn't fall back and rely on that. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So the opening four three, it, when you're behind in the score, it's slightly better to bring two down, but they're they're right. close, no big deal. The double three. Okay, so here this one it preferred to play a little more conservative without leaving that extra blot like this. Look, you slotted it. And yeah, I guess this just makes the asset, the, the race is close. So I think here you don't want to get hit and lose a lot of ground in the race. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So then the two one, now this is the time you were right to be aggressive to come down and make the point. Is now you have a three point board versus a one point board with a blot in it. So, so that was that was very good. Aha. Uh -huh. The five four. This is the other one we looked at is making the four point, resulting in this position, leaving two blots. But kind of have to be careful there. Now I wonder if we look over here. So now it's a two point board. What if White had the three point board here? Now is the safe. Then you. Play. I think you've got to be much safer there. No, it's that, still, to do it. But they're close. Look how close they are. So so this is... Yeah, before it was 07 or something. Yeah, almost a blunder. Yeah. So I think this is, this, is, this is a lesson that I learned. It's like, okay, because there's a stronger board, then you have to be... It's the more the safe play is closer. Yeah. So 
That's important. Okay. What else? Um, the 6-3, looks like these two plays were close. Yeah, that's... Uh... I'm surprised they're that close, but uh I'm surprised. I I, I bet in the rollout it would change things. Um, uh, okay. Then the double four, these were virtually tied between yeah. your play, which resulted in this, and this one, which left a blot, but I certainly like this play better. Okay. And then there was the three two was just slotting. Very good. Double six was a great roll. Bring him around, moving all the freight. And the five two was just clearing the nine point. Very good. The four two, you just had to play safe. And here, here it looks like it wasn't quite enough for a double. Not enough, despite the score. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Um, this is what I like to look at. So here you really need a, a racing lead, right? So let's try to increase the racing lead a little bit and see how much that makes a difference. So that now it's a double. Right. Now four pips. Four pips, Ed. How about this? Now it's borderline. So these are, these are the exercises that I do. Just move one checker, like one over or two over, and see what the difference is. Now you know when it's right to double. Even though at this score, you want to be a little bit more. Well, aggressive. that's the thing. At, at this score, um, you know, maybe you're a bit more aggressive. Yeah. And, and I'm playing XG too, right? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so look, at an even score, uh, at zero, zero, three away, three away, it's a blunder to double. Yeah. But at this score, it's actually not, it's not a terrible error. I mean, for a doubling decision. Um, okay. Then the three, one. These two plays that we were discussing were virtually tied. And then the 3-2 was just clearing. The 2-1 was good because you hit, and there was basically nothing left after this right. game. Okay, then it was the Crawford game. The 2-1, look at that. It likes uh, slotting here. It loses fewer Yeah, games. which is, uh, I know it likes to do that a lot. With the lead, I'd be... Uh... A little more hesitant to do that, but uh... it's interesting. You think about that, but because you retain this anchor when you slot, you lose fewer gammons. So you're losing 16.8% gammons uh, yeah. with the slotting play, but 17.6% gammons with the splitting play. And the difference is only a tenth of a percent in terms of the wins. These are hard. It's not, it's not a big deal. Um, okay, then the double one was, this is something I used to learn, like Falafel used to say, like do things in order. So you really want to make this anchor to prevent being gammoned. You want to make the five point. And then the last one was just moving over for the reason. Well, you know, and, and I think you and I have talked about before and something that, uh, you know, again, less experienced players, um, oftentimes they, they, tend to move doublets in pairs right and you have to kind of discipline yourself to to not do that and um so anyway it, yeah, it's kind of interesting and you, you mentioned falafel who a great friend one thing and one of the i thought very good compliments I ever got from anyone was from falafel. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not an elite player by any means. I don't put as much time into it as many do, but, uh, one time, uh, falafel, we drew each other in Chicago and he, we were laughing, even starting the match. He said, <laughs> one thing, Riles, I always worry about you. He says, you're a dangerous player. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> and, you know, you might not be a great player, but you're a dangerous player, you know? So, <laughs> I, I took that uh, as a nice compliment. Yeah. Did Did you ever have the privilege of having him join you for a commentary? No, I I didn't. In fact, you know he uh, he did commentary several times in uh, Monte Carlo when yeah, yeah. we were doing the streaming and all, but I I was wasn't doing the commentary at that time. Yeah, yeah. it was fantastic. I'll tell you another thing. Um, one time. Uh, 
another one of my good friends, John O'Hagan, told me one time, anytime you roll a double, uh, stop and take a deep breath, look at the entire board and look at all the options because usually there are many more productive options with doubles than with non-doubles, in particular the small doubles like double ones and double twos. Well, and the thing is too with doubles, uh, there, you know, an increased number of permutations available to right. you. Too. So it's just, uh, it's amazing. You know, speaking of Falafel, well, real quickly, um, and he was tremendous uh, commentator. One, obviously he knew the game and great insights, uh, had a lot of fun. Um, you know, I've often mentioned, particularly in the last year, this, uh, you know, the match that Sebastian Wilkinson and I called. Of yes. Victor and uh, Chris Rogers was one of the, the greatest uh, streamed matches in every perspective that I've ever seen. You know, the, the other that I would rank right up there with that perhaps was the, uh, and I forget which year it was, but uh, World Championship final, Lars Trebolt versus Slava Priotkin. And uh, Falafel did the commentary on that. And you can find it. Uh, you yes, I'll put a link in the description. That is uh, the most incredible match, the, the last game particularly. And um, Falafel was just going crazy. But that <laughs> I is, remember uh, that. It, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was great. Um, okay, uh, so we'll continue with the five two. Oh yeah, these two plays were close. The one, the one. This is the one that uh, right, I right. mentioned, but the one you selected is is close. I guess I just didn't like the look of like a stack of five checkers on the point, but there's, it's also not good to have this strip point. Um, okay, and then the three one that was clear to just slot the four point. Nothing, nothing huge here with the three two, the six four, the four two, and now this is this is where things started to get interesting. So yeah, this was this was right to continue to try to make this point, and this play resulting in this position was close as well. Yeah, not significant difference there. Necessarily. Yeah, not a significant difference. I feel like for me and for most people I know, the biggest errors I make are when I fail to even identify the top play. So when when I identify the top play or two plays, I'm actually satisfied in the sense that I, that I actually considered it. So that's good. Uh, okay, so then the 2-1. Oh, yeah, the 6-5 the or 4-3, were they were all close. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then... The two one again, that was good. You brought it up and then moved it in. Okay. And the five four was a great roll. Came out and hit. And then the five one. Yeah, good. You made you made the prime. I might have picked up the checker, but good play. Five two. Oh, look at that. It preferred keeping the prime. Ah, uh, okay. There. Interesting. So now you have sixes and fours to make it directly from the back, whereas here you only have ones, I guess. Right. I, I can see that. All right, then the five one was clear to just make the prime. And that that was pretty much it. There was Posting some technical in plays. From there. Yeah. Yeah, like this one, that this is all the same, you know, it didn't matter. And this this is another one we looked at too. But that was it. Won so, the match. Fairly clean, other than the pass on the first game, perhaps. But uh, yeah, but that's that's a good lesson. It's a good, you know, what I tell people is that, you know, and I was even talking with Dirk Scheman about this. It's like it, it's a good thing when you make mistakes because it's an opportunity to learn. Otherwise, if you play a perfect game, there's nothing to learn from. <laughs> So look at it in a positive way, but, but it was good. Well played. Congratulations. I had a lot of fun. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I certainly enjoyed it. And, you know, it's interesting. Um, whenever I'm playing, I, I have a tendency to play too fast, but uh, you know, in, th in this 
circumstance, I was probably being a bit more uh, deliberate and considerate of all the various options. And, and you know, again, other than the one pass played, uh, played a pretty yeah. clean match. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I was talking with people. I've had a lot of people um, do this with me at all, all different levels. Um, Mark Olson was doing one, and he said it's a little hard to get used to this because you have to explain uh, every move, whereas when you're actually playing, you don't. Uh, however, at the same time, I think I spoke with Dirk Scheman, and in a sense, doing this helps me kind of like put my thoughts you know, forward and understand it a little better and, and play a little bit more slowly and deliberately. And, and sometimes it, it helps. You just have to get used to it. I know Dirk Scheman does these and he plays with a clock. When I do mm -hmm. these on my own, I, I don't play with a clock because I'm not trying to like play speed or anything like that. I'm trying to learn and teach um, and have fun. But I feel like that that's that's kind of helped me in a sense. But, you know, I think in, in you doing teaching and, and others and so forth, you know, to, to have to explain what you're doing is really kind of beneficial to yourself. Uh, you know, if, if you're not doing that, sometimes you'll just kind of play on autopilot or something, you know, make an instinctive move. But if you have to, you have to think about it and explain it to someone else, then oftentimes you don't make some of the simple mistakes you may make otherwise. You know, and it, it's kind of interesting. You know, it's it's tough. Different people are are better teachers than others for various reasons. But you know, I always think of it if you regard, uh, you know, some of your best like baseball coaches or baseball managers and and so forth are not the best players, right? right? Because the best players, you you know, maybe you go ask Ted Williams that. How do you hit, you know, or, or whatever. And, and they never had to learn it. You know, it was almost a innate skill that they had and so forth where you get somebody who became a good hitter, you know, they had to be taught the fundamentals and, and learn all yeah. that stuff. And consequently they can repeat the teaching of those fundamentals to others. And, uh, you know, maybe we see that in a, to a degree in backgammon too, the, the real naturals, um, you know, they're good teachers. I'm not knocking anyone necessarily, but you know, those, those that have had to work at it harder and learn it, you know, perhaps the hard way, perhaps they're, it's easier for them to explain it to others. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I also, it reminds me, I had a professor in college one time, he said, if you really know something, you would be able to explain it to someone else. If you cannot explain it to someone else, then that means you don't understand it completely. Right. Good point. So, so good, good. Well, I had a lot of fun. It's always a pleasure to see you. I wanted to congratulate you again on all of your achievements. Uh, recently, the Marriage Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you very much for everything you have done and continue to do. Uh, looking forward to all your streams. Uh, in the future, I always wake up early for that. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's kind of get uh, get busy here over the next few months. And wishing and, you, you know, and those, like in Chicago, I think we're streaming for five days, maybe five days, I think. But then you get into Stockholm with the WBGF thing before the Swedish Open. That's seven continuous days. Monte Carlo is eleven continuous days, and uh, Dubai is. It's only like five again. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but it's exhausting. Uh, I know, I know. But it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it's neat. And you and I have talked about it before. And I'm sure you are increasingly getting a bit of this yourself. But, um, you know, to be recognized and identified and, and oh, I know you. Or yeah. yeah. That's kind of a neat uh, <laughs> consequence of some of the things we do. Uh, yeah, yeah, I remember you told uh, that story, and um, I don't know if I told you, but there's there's a a market, you know, right next door to my office. Sometimes I go get lunch there, and there's a lady that makes like some of the food, and she said she recognized me from my YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I told you it's funny. You get all kinds of stuff like that, and even in uh, New York this year, a guy 
heard me talking to some other people as he walked by and he recognized my voice. Not ah, yeah. see me. He just recognized the voice and he turned around. And he said, you're that commentary guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Fantastic. Uh, the so king of commentary, the king and queen of commentary, Bill Riles and Tara Mendocino. Thank you. Thank you again very much. Do you have any final comments before we conclude? Nah, I'm good. I enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. It's always a pleasure to see you. Uh, thank you again for everything. Wishing you safe travels. Looking forward to all of your work. And I hope to see you soon, uh, hopefully in person. <laughs> okay. I'll see you in person in some time. Um, all right. We'll go ahead and conclude. Thank you again, Bill Riles, for joining me. Thank you to the viewers for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, please like and subscribe, and you'll be notified every time I upload a new video. Let me know what you think in the comments below what you like to see in future videos so I can work on that. I appreciate your super thanks. These small donations help me continue to create the high-quality content that you enjoy. And now with the membership feature, you can get exclusive access to the most popular videos. Again, my book, Backgammon, Backend Strategies, is available. There's a link in the description to where you can get it. And if you're interested in lessons, please contact me via email. I'll put my email address in the description. I'll put all the various links to Bill's sites in the description as well. I look forward to seeing everyone in future videos. And until then, keep rolling your dice.